Hello, fiber friends, and welcome to another episode of Jillian Eve Vlogmas. When I opened up the Vlogmas box, all of the boxes on the top <laughs> were empty. We're down to the second row. We're scraping the bottom of the barrel. Maybe that's dramatic. But today we are going to spin box number seven, whatever is in here. And I'm thinking we've had a lot of different kinds of spinning tools and equipment. I will be getting to some very historic replicas. I'm thinking maybe some Neolithic, maybe some medieval. You'll have to let me know what you think in the comments. What other kinds of tools would you like to see that we haven't seen yet? Maybe some more antique wheels. Um, maybe, I don't know. Let me know what you wanna see. If I can do it, we'll, we'll try to do it. But I think today, we are going to use a Turkish spindle or a cross arm spindle because the arms cross. It's a little more descriptive. I had a video recently using one of these and I had some wonderful fiber friends from Turkey come to the comments and let me know that the word for this in Turkish is Kirman. And this is a Snyder, uh, let's see, 1.3 ounces or 37 grams. I get this question a lot about whether or not the weight of the spindle uh, makes a difference as to what kind of yarn you're spinning. And this is a really interesting topic of study. There have been some researchers and archeologists who have proposed that the weight of the wool is what would make a difference specifically as to what uh, thin or thick type of yarn you're going to spin with that grist. As someone who has spun with a lot of different form factors, spindles, supported, you know, in hand clasped, drop spindles, top whirl, bottom whirl, <laughs> it's not that simple. Weight of the spindle does matter, particularly if it's like a suspended situation where you've got the weight pulling down on the yarn you're making. Uh, that can matter if it's too heavy it's going to snap that yarn because it's not fully made yet right it hasn't been maybe plied and finished so the weight of the spindle can affect that but i also find that the whorl makes a difference and so for a turkish spindle or cross arm spindle like this but we have these wide arms reaching out and that gives us a lot of um momentum to keep spinning. So this is going to spin a little bit longer than if it was the exact same weight, but the whorl was closer to the shaft of the spindle. If it was all, you know, <laughs> tucked up in there, um, it would give you a fast burst of, of spin, but it wouldn't spin for as long. So these are able to spin a little bit longer, but I do find that they spin a little slower because that mass distribution is further out from the center of rotation. So it gets into physics and all of these particular things. And then of course we have, what fiber are you using? What technique are you using? How much, you know, twist are you giving it? And so all of those things matter. And I guess it's just like anything with spinning. If you ask a question, <laughs> I'll say, how does that work for you? <laughs> because really it is very much dependent on so many factors. It's hard to say black and white, this equals that. But it's fun to talk about, isn't it? <laughs> I think it is. That's why we chat about these things here, I guess. <laughs> so today, um, in addition to our fairy tale story, while we spin by the fireside, I'd also like to give you a couple updates. I have an update on the dress I'm sewing. Um, I want to do a little glimpse of the spins so far, and we'll do that at the end when we have today's to add to that pile. Um, and I wanted to mention a couple things about the Nano. In the last video, uh, episode six, we had the guest starring Wheel Daddy Mark to help me upgrade my Nano 1 to a Nano 2. Now we do have a Nano 2, it's brand new in the box. I peeked at it, but it hasn't been used. And that is the giveaway for Vlogmas. So at the end of Vlogmas, I will pick randomly a comment from the Vlogmas videos. You can find more details about that giveaway in the video description. Um, so leave a comment if you want to enter to win that giveaway. All right, let's open our box for today. Oh, day number seven. Here 
we have our blessing. <laughs> it says, may you have courage to pick up where you left off. This one's like deeply philosophical. What is, what is Mark doing to us today? But also, who has a pile of stuff that they just need to finish? Maybe this is inspiration to go attack that UFO project. <laughs> Unfinished object project. <laughs> oh my goodness. The fiber today, I, I hope you enjoy this one. It is sweet. <laughs> it's candy. <laughs> my bad puns forever. All right, we have Targi, and this is a royal rich sapphire blue, and it is squoosh. <laughs> it is so squooshy. Oh, I love this Targi and this blue color. I had so much fun dyeing this blue color. Um, just, oh, I love these full saturated jewel tones. I love it. <laughs> so I think this will be great for spinning with um, with the Turkish spindle. And while we spin, I'm going to tell a story. And then after this is all spun up and plied, I will show you the spins so far. We will lay them all out and get a good look. Now, if you um, were wondering where this blue came from, this is the blue that you get in the hottest, hottest flames of the fire. Our whole Vlogmas series of spins is inspired by the fire. So uh, when you look deep into the fire and you get those hot, hot blue flickery flames down in there, that's where this blue comes from. And I love it. It is so, so pretty. So I am kind of lately really digging this idea that I don't need a leader for anything. <laughs> it was one of those... Um, Okay, so if you have to spin to make a leader, where did the first leader come from? Somebody said that, you know, just as a joke, obviously. But then I was like, wait, yeah. Why, why do we need a leader? If we're spinning yarn and making yarn, why do we need to make a leader? Or, I mean, have a leader. I don't know, my brain kind of melted. I was like, wait. And then, <laughs> I mentioned before, I found um, some footage of some women who were spinning flax and they didn't have a leader they just got their t flax twisted stuck it on the wheel spun the bobbin around a few times just to get it wrapped under its own tension and then started and then off they went and it makes a lot of sense when we use large um, winding things like that because if you get to the end and you've got something tied on your bobbin and you get to the end it just absolutely will yank everything towards itself. It'll take your wheel down. It'll take your lazy Kate down. It'll just be a disaster. Um, so I was like, yeah, I don't even need a leader for my bobbins. I demonstrated that, but also I don't need a leader for my spindles. I can just start spinning and there it is. So that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Try it and see. I feel like it it made me level up somehow. Um, I I just got a little bit of the fluff hooked around the tip of the spindle here and I'm just spinning it in the direction I want it to go and then there it is I have a leader and I can just tie it on and continue spinning. There are different ways to wrap your turtle, but one of the most common questions that I get is how do you make it look so pretty? So I got a little bit done on here and now I want to show you what I'm doing to make it look so pretty. Basically, as I wind, I go over two arms and then under one arm and then I go over two arms and then I go under one arm and every time I go over two arms, I am laying down, instead of just always coming up towards the shaft of the spindle, I'm laying it next to the yarn that was there before. And so I build it out layer by layer, and eventually it is going to lay out so that it comes all the way down to the arm. I'll keep wrapping, 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 it comes all the way down to the arm. And then I start again 
where I wrap it up to the shaft and then build it until it comes all the way down to the arm. So each time I'm laying it out next to what came before until it gets to the arm and then I go back up to the top. The Elves and the Shoemaker by the Brothers Grimm. A shoemaker, by no fault of his own, had become so poor that at last he had nothing left but leather for one pair of shoes. So in the evening, he cut out the shoes which he wished to begin to make the next morning, and as he had a good conscience, he laid down quietly in his bed, commented to himself God, and fell asleep. In the morning, after he had said his prayers and was just going to sit down to work, the two shoes stood quite finished on his table. He was astounded and knew not what to say to it. He took the shoes in his hands to observe them closer, and they were so neatly made that there was not one bad stitch in them, just as if they were intended as a masterpiece. Soon after, a buyer came in, and as the shoes pleased him so well, he paid more for them than was customary, and, with the money, the shoemaker was able to purchase leather for two pairs of shoes. He cut them out at night, and next morning was about to set to work with fresh courage, but he had no need to do so, for when he got up they were already made, and buyers also were not wanting, who gave him money enough to buy leather for four pairs of shoes. The following morning, too, he found the four pairs made, and so it went on constantly. What he cut out in the evening was finished by the morning, so that he soon had his honest independence again, and at last became a wealthy man. Now it befell that one evening, not long before Christmas, when the man had been cutting out, he said to his wife before going to bed, What think you if we were to stay up tonight to see who it is that lends us this helping hand? The woman liked the idea, and lighted a candle, and they hid themselves in the corner of the room behind some clothes which were hanging up there, and watched. When it was midnight, two pretty little naked men came, sat down by the shoemaker's table, took all the work which was cut out before them, and began to stitch and sew and hammer so skillfully and so quickly with their little fingers that the shoemaker could not turn away his eyes for astonishment. They did not stop until all was done and stood finished on the table, and they ran quickly away. The next morning the woman said, The little men have made us rich and we really must show that we are grateful for it. They run about so and have nothing on, and must be cold. I'll tell thee what I'll do. I will make them little shirts and coats and vests and trousers, and knit both of them a pair of stockings. And do thou, too, make them two little pairs of shoes. The man said, I shall be very glad to do it. And one night, when everything was ready, they laid their presents all together on the table, instead of the cut-out work and then concealed themselves to see how the little men would behave. At midnight, they came bounding in and wanted to get to work at once, but as they did not find any leather cut out, but only the pretty little articles of clothing, they were at first astonished, and then they showed intense delight. They dressed themselves with the greatest rapidity, putting on the pretty clothes and singing. Now we are boys so fine to see, why should we longer cobblers be? Then they danced and skipped and leapt over chairs and benches. At last they danced out of doors. From that time forth they came no more, but as long as the shoemaker lived, all went well with him, and his undertakings prospered. So many people were reminded of this story when we read the story by Beatrix Potter about the tailor of Gloucester. And the thing I was thinking about with this story, um, there's a YouTube channel I watch. It's Nicole Rudolph's channel. Go check it out if you haven't. She has some wonderful historical um, sewing and also shoemaking. And so I was thinking about one of her videos that I had seen recently where she was making shoes and the force and abrasion that the linen sewing thread goes through to be able to be pulled through the leather. Um, it's a lot. And from a spinning perspective, I was really fascinated. Of course, waxing the thread keeps it from being abraded so, you know, so much that it falls apart. But from a spinning perspective, especially looking at spinning in a historical context, there was such a variety of necessary spinning to make all the things that needed to be made. And 
I think that there are some things in our modern life that are so ubiquitous we don't really consider that at some point someone had to spin for that purpose to make that thing. And that includes everything from it, curtains, <laughs> the clothes hanging up in the story that they hid behind. Were those, were those bed clothes? Were those clothes drying that had been laundered? What, what were those clothes? I'm not sure. Maybe there's a better clue to that in the original German. But um, if anyone knows, leave a comment. But of course, the ribbons and laces and all of the linings that were that were often linen linings everything to make shoes at one point those shoes were being made entirely from hand spun and hand woven items that were brought together with leather and whatever else was used to make um, the various other parts of the shoe but I just I think about that and actually seeing someone sewing with the kind of linen that it takes to hold a shoe together and have structure and for it to be sturdy it really makes me think about everything that goes into hand spinning yarn and I love those little thought trails. <laughs> I hope you do too. <laughs> I don't think I'll be making my own shoes. I haven't um, felt the need to do that personally, but maybe I will get some linen at some point just to see how sturdy it is and compare it to my own flax and my own linen spinning because I find that very interesting. And um, I wish that maybe we could all have some helpful elves around the house that would come in and get things done for us while we sleep. <laughs> that would certainly be a time saver. So, tippets for mice and clothes for elves. I, I enjoyed this story and I hope you did too. I've been spinning <laughs> for a while. I did put the wool onto my distaff, my Roman style distaff for spinning and that was helping me keeping it out of the way while I was spinning. My fire's out so you can see it's been a little bit that I've been spinning and I don't think I'm going to have it finished for this video. It's just taken me a little bit and that's okay. I don't want to rush. This blue is so beautiful. I enjoyed dyeing this wool so much and I want to enjoy, <laughs> I want to enjoy the color of it and the feel of it. I love this squishy targi. It's so springy. Um, it, it's just really pleasant to work with. And so I will have the update for how this spin turns out. I will have that for you in the next video. But I did promise a couple things before we go. I want to show you my dress, where I'm at with that, and I want to show you all of the spins so far, because we're halfway, and I have six spins to show you. So, here we go. Here's this one up close. So here is what I've spun so far. I really, really love this blue color. I am more than halfway done, so I'll probably watch a show tonight, um, relax for a bit and just finish spinning this. Maybe I'll watch one of those movies that was recommended in the previous episode. And uh, the other thing I have to show you is my dress. I moved the camera back so hopefully you can get a good look at it. It is mostly done but there is one problem with it and the problem is that when I wear it the front is gaping just a little bit. Here we are, now you can see it a little bit better. So the front here, it just, it kinda on me, hangs out a little bit like that. Now, when I cut this out, this was meant to be two separate pieces in the front that would then have a French seam um, coming down the center. So of course, if you're cutting out two separate pieces, there's a built-in seam allowance that's gonna get taken up into the French seam. But I knew that, and so when I cut them out, I didn't, include those seam allowances. I removed those seam allowances so that it would be one full solid front piece, but I'm still having this gaping problem. So I thought maybe that was because I had altered the way that I cut out the pieces to avoid the second seam down the center, but I accounted for that. So I was like, what is going on? So perhaps, maybe, um, I think sort of where the shoulders are um, and just move this seam so that it, it comes up a little bit over here and then a little bit over there. I thought, you know, maybe I could just put that second seam in, but when I tried that, 
it was pulling the fabric over here. So I, I don't think what needs to happen is an adjustment here. I think what needs to happen is sort of a lift, an adjustment here. Um, so it's not quite done. And I did, I hand stitched, I hand stitched this collar on here. It looks so good. I was so proud of it. Um, <laughs> but I'll have to undo that on the shoulders. Oh well, that's what it is. So my dress is almost finished, but not quite. And I did get the more, more of the ends <laughs> weaved into the uh, crop sweater that I knit that goes with this dress. So we're not quite there, but we're so close. All right, thanks for joining me on that journey. Let's take a look at all of the yarn we have spun so far. And I'll see you in the next one. Happy spinning.